I don't know if you appreciate what to me is one of the most fascinating facts in the world, which is regardless our cell body and how we look like, you know, regardless if, if, if an animal looks like that and it has tusks or it swims in the ocean and it has stripes and gills or it has wings and, and lays eggs and lives uh, as a worm for a while or uh, the woman and man's body, which are slightly different. All this diversity, all this diversity was generated at some point because we all came from a single cell. So at some point, we all were one cell. Nothing but one cell. And that one cell had to grow in number, because clearly we're composed now from more than one cell. And on top of that, these cells that were generated out of this one cell, and we will see what that is and what it comes from, had to differentiate to form the different organs and the different parts of our body. Moreover, they had to do that at the right place at the right time. Growing a foot on, on your head, it's only good if you are an octopus. <laughs> but it's kind of useless if you are a human. So all that has to happen somehow out of this one single cell. And what I'm going to show you, it's a movie that I, I don't know how many times a year I show this because I show it also in my, in my undergrad class, but I don't get tired of seeing it. What, what you're going to see on the screen are these little balls. And these little balls are nothing but an embryo that is a two-cell stage. So it's one stage later than this one single cell I show you. So for example, this is one cell, and that's one cell. So this was an egg that was fertilized, it was allowed to divide once, and what you're going to see now, it's how these two cells become an animal with an eye, with muscles, with something that swims. So you will see this marvelous process right now. And I have to say, I have to thank Alibri Balu from Rockefeller University, which is the person that provided this, this slide. Okay, are you ready? So what you're going to see at the beginning is nothing changes on size. What happens is there's a rapid increase in the cell number. So you will see this dividing into little squares, little squares, little squares. Then it's going to move, it's a process called gastrulation. And out of gastrulation, there are the three germ layers. She mentioned one end there. And out of that, you get organogenesis, organs, organs form. And out of that, you get a tadpole, okay? So pay attention. It's important. This goes fast. But this, this is, to me, the most fascinating problem in biology. So this dividing, 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 dividing. Now, soon it will start gastrulation. You will see they have some... Streaks, gastrulation, a lot of cell movement. See, that's where the neural tube is going to be. Now this is shaped like something that you're familiar with. And these things go out and they start swimming and they have an eye and they have a brain and they have muscle and they have gut and they're done. So we, as humans, went to a very similar process. And there's this em a, a quote in embryology that is, is not married, it's not um, graduation, the most important part in your life was going through that. And I think it's true. <laughs> Without that, there is nothing else. And we did it successfully, because we're here. The issue that becomes obvious now is that we want to do that again in the lab. And that was there I was saying that it's so difficult. And it's frustrating, because a tadpole can do it. But it doesn't matter how smart we think we are, it's extremely hard to reproduce and control in the lab. So the question in stem cell biology, now that we can isolate stem cells, it's how to get them to do this at will. The day we learn how to do this and control it at will in the lab, we will have a chance of generating cells or organs to study or maybe replace in the future. So that is the motivation for this. That's why we have to understand developmental biology. That's how we can apply developmental biology. Yeah? So to me, the, the distinction between applied science and basic science doesn't make any sense. If you study in embryology, which could be as basic as understanding why do you get an eye, where it, it became absolutely necessary to apply stem cell technologies to the clinic. So let's revise on the first part of the talk. We're going to see how these things happen. What can we do in, and what happens in, in, in IVF 
clinics, which are important for the beginning of this process. We get into a window of what we do in the lab, and we're going to end on a controversial topic, I guarantee you, from now. So, uh, but, but I will give you all the background you need to know to then make your own judgment. This is what the story starts. There is a sperm that meets an egg. Each of these contain half of the genetic material. They fertilize, they form this one single cell where we all come from. And what you saw, it's basically from this cell, a lot of growth in cell number and differentiation into cells that combine to form tissues and organ. An organ, it's a combination of tissues, there is a combination of multiple cell types. So for therapies, sometimes we would like to make a particular cell to study. Sometimes, even for transplantation, we would like to make a particular cell. But sometimes that's not enough. And what is failing, for example, in a patient, or what we are interested to study, is how these cells interact with each other in a particular organ, or we need to replace that organ. So this is an extra layer of complexity. Making a neuron is not making a brain, it's just making a neuron. Yeah? So keep that in mind, please. And also because we are at the American Museum of Natural History, I think it's important to also consider some historical aspects of science. And particularly um, after uh, this march for science and this, this question of what science means. And science is a, the best explanation we have right now for the reality we perceive. And the beauty about science is that we can challenge that. Not only we can challenge, we should challenge it all the time. And we should come up with hypotheses. If I would have given you this talk a few years ago, the process that goes from this to that would have been the following. The sperm contains a little human, and that little human that comes within the sperm is being fed by the woman, the egg, and host in the womb for nine months to develop. And that was science at the time. So we were allowed to challenge that model. And I think it's important to understand that this fits the cosmovision at the time. Women could not be important at certain part in, in history. Thankfully, we, we changed that. Yeah? But I think it's important to keep in mind that everything we do, it's our understanding, our model of reality right now. So let's go back to this. Let's see what we how we understand this process now. The sperm contains half of the genetic material we need. The other half is provided by the egg. The sperm, for the purpose of this, it's just a uh, delivery of half of genetic material. It's the least important player in this, uh, uh, in this equation. We are becoming dispensable as a male, as a half of the gender. Um, and at fertilization, there is this half of genetic material that you receive from your father and half of genetic material that you receive from your mother. They combine, and fertilization makes the zygote. And it's the zygote that will continue. So keep in mind that to go from an egg to a zygote, you need a complete genetic complement. By the way, in nature, there are species that can go without a sperm. And they will generate a, a haploid animal, which contains half of the genetic material on the, from the mother. Do you know an example of that? Did, who had honey in the last three days? Yeah, so what happened to the male? The drone comes from an unfertilized egg. And there are sharks that can do that and so on. So, again, we are, like I'm, I am at home, absolutely dispensable. So what happens after this? There is fertilization, there is complete genetic material, and it's this zygote that starts differentiating and growing. And we're going to pause on another important stage in early development, which is called blastocyst. And this blastocyst that comes after the zygote, so the num cell number increased, and now you can see it has two structures, an outer structure and an inner structure. The inner structure is called the inner cell mass, and the outer is a trophoblast. The inner cell mass, it's what will develop into the embryo that it's basically us. Does anybody know what trophoblast make? We all carry the scar from it. We all carry something that shows we had it at the time and we don't have it anymore. The placenta, exactly, we all carry the belly button. The scar of the umbilical cord and the placenta that 
we lost soon after birth. And this is an important distinction because although this is a full embryo, only the inner cell mass contributes to our adult body. And that will become relevant when we think about where the stem cells come from. I'm going to make a little detour, detour now and we'll talk about uh, uh, something that we will link to stem cell derivation for a second. So think about this. This is the whole embryo. So IVF clinics all the time do this. They get a sperm from a donor or from the father. They get an egg that they retrieve from a, from a woman. They combine them in vitro, so they fertilize them in vitro. They allow, to, they allow them to develop up to this stage, blastocyst. And this is the stage that they transfer into a woman for uh, a pregnancy. So a success IVF, the first step is doing this. And good quality blastocyst, and you might have he heard that, uh, have two purposes. One is they are transferred back to the female and go good quality ones that are not being used for transfer are being frozen to keep for the future. Yeah? So when women go back to uh, uh, get a, 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 another one of these, they are retrieved from a freezer. So it's kind of a delay twin because they were fertilized at the same time. There is one trick that you may have heard uh, uh, in the news not long ago, and I thought it was a good time to bring it, which is uh, these mitochondria replacement therapies or something like that. And so one of the things that I was telling you, the sperm comes from a man and the egg comes from a, from a woman, but the egg also carries these little uh, organelles called mitochondria, and the mitochondria carry their own little genome, so they have DNA in them. It's called mitochondrial DNA. And sometimes that DNA carries a mutation. And because mitochondria are really important, they, are the f they provide energy for the cells, among other things. When there's a mitochondrial defect, it's kind of a nasty thing to have. So if they would keep going and merge the sperm with the egg and let this to develop, the cells that will produce the embryo, also the placenta, will inherit these defective mitochondria. So IVF clinics can do this trick like very special ones. It's only done three times as far as I know. They fertilize the sperm with the egg. They get the egg that has now the genetic material that is the combination of this man and the woman that donated the egg. But this woman also had a genetic problem in the mitochondria. So the eggs carry this defective mitochondria. And a trick that can be applied, and you will see it applied a few times in this talk, is you can take that nucleus with the genetic material that is a combination of these two, take it out of this and now, get a second female that donates an egg with normal mitochondria, enucleate that, remove the nucleus, and now you have the two pieces again. You have a full genetic complement, not half, because it's half plus half is one, and now you have an egg that doesn't have any genetic material. So combining these two, now you reconstitute an egg with the full genetic material, and now you allow this to develop, and now it will inherit the mitochondria for the healthy donor and not the one. No? So that it's basically what you've heard in the news not long ago uh, about mitochondrial replacement therapies. You're going to see a couple of tricks with this, so that's why it's important that we introduce one step at a time. <clears throat> the, the, the normal protocol is this one, no? In IVF clinics, sperm, egg, zygote, blastocyst. And we say that these, it's what it's transferred to uh, females, and the embryo itself, as, will be generated for something that is called the inner cell mass. And the inner cell mass, it's right before this very important step called gastrulation that you saw in the movie where the cells start moving around, and this is the first big, 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 big differentiation of cells uh, into different layers, basically, it's like a commitment step. And so, importantly, at this stage, there was not a huge commitment into what part of the body each cell will generate. And it's from there that two things can happen. This is allowed to develop and forms a embryo, or these it's taken into a tissue culture dish, the inner cell mass is amplified, and that's an embryonic stem cell. 
So now you know how to get embryonic stem cells from a, 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 a from research, for example. They come from IVF clinics. So this will be the protocol. That's called the morula. This is the blastocyst, the inner cell mass. It's taken out. These are disintegrated. And they are plated in wonderful conditions and goodies that took a lot of time to develop. Because if you think about it, these cells can become everything, can become every cell in our body, and they will like to do that. You can grow them forever as long as you're careful and you grow them in the right conditions. The moment you're not careful, they will differentiate into whatever they want to be. So it's an in vitro artifact. We are freezing, artificially freezing this step in development, this inner cell mass state in the lab. That's a whole trick. And we can cultivate those and we can keep them frozen in this state. And because we, they are frozen in that state, at some point, as Zara was saying, we can give them the right conditions uh, to see if we can aim or, or we, can, we can differentiate them into different cells of the body. So the task now, you already know the logic, how to derive embryonic stem cells. The big task now is how to make this embryonic stem cell to do something we want. Short disclaimer and, and you know, going aside, where are these blastocysts coming from? Well, you know, they're coming from IVF uh, clinics. And we already mentioned that these good quality blastocysts are being frozen or transferred into females. The rest are discarded. So there are two ways that can be discarded. They can just be discarded or they can be dis discarded in the process of generating embryonic stem cell lines. This can, for example, be either just bad quality blastocysts that nobody would transfer, or it could be blastocysts that were screened because both parents carry a mutation and they wanted to be sure that their child doesn't carry that mutation. So out of all the blastocysts they produce in vitro, maybe some of them carry a mutation that will cause a severe disease. So they choose not to transfer that back into the woman because they choose not to have a baby with that disease. That blastocyst becomes an invaluable resource for the scientific community because now we can derive an embryonic stem cell with the genetic, genetic makeup of a human disease. And it's being used to study what goes wrong and what could go wrong and what, could be do done, what can be done to improve the survival of a given organ or cell. So the blastocysts that are used to derive embryonic stem cells would have been discarded anyway. And for the people in the audience that were old, are old enough to remember some of the controversies a few years ago, uh, where there was kind of this make-believe that uh, there were, uh, how was the sentence he was used? Uh, they create life to destroy it. That's not true. This, it's illegal to do that. One side note, uh, and I'm not going to make a judgment of what you consider life or not. I'm just going to say that we should have, and, and this is more, I'm preparing for what I'm going to tell you at the end, which we didn't learn much from the past and we, we let things go too fast before we all engage in this conversation. And we engage in the conversation, as a scientist, we take the fall. Uh, after there was outrageous statement about, you know, you are, you are you generating, creating life to destroy, you know, people will ask me, would you put babies in blenders? What do you do in the lab? No? And, and the answer is no. You know, we use embryos that were destined to be destroyed uh, anyway, these blastocysts, that will never generate a baby because they are so defective that that will be a miscarriage. So that, those things happen normally and everybody old enough knows people that 50% of the women might have had a miscarriage at one time point. So this is one of the things that where it doesn't go wrong. So nature does it all the time. It's not, it's not a lab uh, uh, freak thing we, we have. The other one is when you consider what's alive or what's not, where life starts, one of the things to consider is the uh, legal implications of that. And please remember this because we're going to come back with that. Once 
something is legally defined as a human life, it has a consequence. The easiest thing to explain is the firefighter. There's a building on fire. There's a kindergarten on the fourth floor. 400 toddlers. There is an IVF clinic on the second floor. This is life, human life. The IVF clinic has a thousand of these in a like liquid nitrogen tank. The firefighter is forced by law to take the action that will save the greatest number of life if he or she has to choose to do one of the two. 400 live toddlers, 1,000 live freezer. By law, he's forced to save the greatest number of life. So the, what we call life or not has not only moral, but also legal implications. Keep that in mind. We're going to come back to what we call human life at the end in a probably unexpected way.